वेलकम टू नेट बुक स्टडी दिस द डेली करंट अफेयर्स एनालिसिस ऑफ 19th मई 2024 एंड इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द इंपॉर्टेंट न्यूज आर्टिकल्स फ्रॉम हिंदू न्यूज़पेपर एज वेल एज इंडियन एक्सप्रेस न्यूज़पेपर अलोंग विद दैट प्रीवियस इयर्स क्वेश्चंस आर आल्सो गोइंग टू बी डिस्कस्ड लेट्स गेट इनटू द डिस्कशन ऑफ दिस द फर्स्ट आर्टिकल टॉक्स अबाउट एफडीआई एफडीआई स्टैंड्स फॉर फॉरेन डायरेक्ट इन्वेस्टमेंट हियर एंड लेट्स सी व्हाट एग्जैक्टली दिस न्यूज़ आर्टिकल इज टॉकिंग अबाउट इट मेनली फोकसिंग ऑन ईजिंग एफडीआई नॉर्म्स द Indian government, it is giving that green signal. It is conveying its message message to the world economy that see we are opening up our investment arena where we are going to ease out the FDI norms. Usually, whenever the investment comes, there are tariff barriers in the country and there are non-tariff barriers in the country. And government is telling that we are going to make sure that both tariff as well as the non-tariff barriers that is going to be eased out so that foreign investment it is going to be easier to invest. in india this is what this is what india is telling this is what the green signal it is giving to the world economy and let's see what exactly this news article is talking about here it has been mentioned that very recently few weeks ago even in the space sector indian government has told that we are inviting investment in the space sector also and this is a new area usually the space sector and the financial sector somewhere india was very skeptical and it was it was having that control over all these uh, sectors so you always thought that foreign investment here it is going to distort the economy it might impact the economy in a negative way that fear was there now india is opening up its foreign investment for a wider players here and even if you look at the space sector uh, usually in the space sector there are three important aspects comes under with respect to foreign investment one is satellite and second one is launch vehicles and the third is system parts and government has opened up fdi for all these aspects for system parts it is 100% fdi and for launch vehicles it is 49 it's easy directly you can uh, uh, implement or directly you can invest but after crossing 49% you have to take permission from the government so even though it is 100% fdi is open but government uh, permission is required with respect to launch vehicles and also the satellite formations also so this is with respect to space sector and the same uh, way of uh, implementation indian government is looking with respect to other areas also let us open our investment 100% but let's make sure that after certain threshold let these investors take permission from government see this screening procedure is just to avoid uh, unserious or unwanted or any uh, fraudulent investment that happens in the country and if you look at the last few years overall india has taken a decision that we are going to have a liberalized fdi policy in our country and for almost all the most of the segments uh, still now railways it's not open to foreign investment and atomic sector it is not open to foreign investment there are these kind of foreign these kind of uh, areas where fdi is not allowed but on the whole in a most of the sectors in our country where uh, government has taken a decision that we are going to liberalize the foreign direct investment in our country and in the entire south asian region south asian usually uh, the it comes sri lanka nepal bangladesh pakistan india this is south asian country in this entire region india has the most liberal foreign direct investment policies and even uh, you can consider that india is one among the very few countries where foreign investment policies are quite liberal so this is what this uh, particular article is talking about but let me give you guys background information regarding foreign direct investment also see usually foreign investment there are two types if uh, di foreign direct investment then comes fpi foreign portfolio investment portfolio investment it mainly focuses on stocks so it mainly buys the equities of a listed company so it focus on that aspect foreign direct investment it invests on the infrastructural aspects of a particular company so even day to day uh, power or the managerial power this is also going to come under the foreign direct investment and let's see a uh, few aspects of foreign direct investment here so as the name indicates foreign direct investment it means that investment is coming from some other country so it is an investment made by a party from one country and to the investment in a different country in uh, especially investing in a business investing in a corporation in some other country and main objective here is is the long term partnership you are investing in a infrastructure you are investing in a building a company developing a company so it's a long term partnership and usually uh, 
see fdi if i am a foreign investors and i want to invest i have money and i want to invest where exactly i invest i invest in those companies where i can make my money where where i can make profit for my investment so usually developing countries are those countries that are those economies which attracts these foreign investment these days and india being one among the major developing countries india is attracting a big chunk of foreign direct investment in the country and another aspect is see investment one side it is economy it is money so but foreign direct investment is that beyond this money and beyond this economy see i i am investing in a particular company it means that i want this company to be successful so just investing in money it is not going to give me proper results what i have to do i have to make sure that it is working properly i have to make sure that the workers they have the skills see all these aspects should also be taken into the consideration so fdi along with money it gets the skill workforce also and it it is going to make sure that even the growth aspects and the growth perspective is also going to get better with respect to investment also so it brings skills it brings technology and it is going to bring knowledge also so fdi is going to play a very important role with respect to overall development of a country and as i told you india it has a very big market and india has a very big middle class also so whatever the investment coming into the country somewhere the investor they are they have that confidence that we can get our money back along with some profits also so another advantage for india is one thing is it is a developing country and the thing is there is a demographic dividend and there is a skillful workforce all these things are fine along with that even government is also taking a positive step government is also giving tax benefits it is giving tax breaks and subsidies are give, given by government see these kind of steps steps taken by governments that is also going to push the foreign investment in the country so for india we can see even government is also doing a positive role with respect to foreign direct investment in the country uh, see uh, we opened our economy in 1991 during lpg reform because see in 1999 91 our uh, balance of payment situation was very bad so we had a money crunch at that point of time we had to take money from imf so whenever you take money from imf and the world bank somehow it comes with some kind of conditions and even this time also in 1991 it came with a con condition that a condition was india has to open its market to the world economy at that point the we liberalized our uh, investment policies and we started getting investment from outside the country and this liberalization of economy it has pushed india in a positive direction only we were very reluctant we were very hesitant with respect to foreign investment uh, entering in the country but up down the line after 10 years we have realized that this has changed the economy and this has given the push what india wanted so these are the background information regarding foreign direct investment but let's see uh, see i told you that now india in this article it is telling that india is opening the fdi sector to fdi norms it is easing out fdi norms to various sectors but there are some areas where fdi is prohibited and let's see those areas the uh, important areas includes lottery industries where fdi is totally prohibited here and including uh, internet lotteries also and then gambling and betting in ca uh, in casinos even these aspects are also uh, banned from uh, foreign direct investment and nidhi corporation cheat, cheat funds even these are also banks you can open the banks even fdi is, uh, uh, is foreign di uh, direct investment is accepted in the banking sector also but not in the nidhi corporation and chit uh, fund these kind of uh, organizations and transferable developmental rights and tobacco and tobacco related products like cigars uh cigarettes all these aspects even uh, foreign investment is banned in this area also and primarily two aspects two sectors where uh, investment is totally banned that is atomic energy that is nuclear energy and the second thing is railway operations so these are the areas where foreign investment is not allowed in our country these are the prohibited sectors in our country and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2021 there are four entities have been given and you need to find that which one of the above can be included in foreign direct investment the four ent uh, entities the first entity is 
foreign current convertible bonds yes you can consider as a foreign uh, direct investment here foreign institutional investment with certain condition see here it has been mentioned that institutional investment see not all the institutional investors go and buy the uh, stocks or equities even there are some institutional investors they invest in companies also they invest in infrastructure also so this also comes under the ambit of fdi with certain conditions here that has to be noted here and the third is gdr that is global depository receipts this is also true and the fourth one non-resident external deposit this is wrong so one two three is the right option with respect to fdi option a is the right option here and let's move to the next article the next article is regarding hpv vaccine here and what exactly this hpv vaccine is it's human papilloma virus here see in this article it is mentioned that you can see the headline HPV vaccine prevents cervical cancer in deprived groups. A study has been conducted and in this study it has been mentioned that CSB HPV vaccine was uh, constituted, sorry was administered uh, to the uh, school children and down the years after 12 years study has been conducted and the study gave the positive results and in that study it has been mentioned that especially it has directly impacted the lives of those people belong to the vulnerable sections those people belong to the deprived sections here then this is what the study is talking about and this study is not conducted in england sorry india this conducted in england here and uh, but the thing is why is it necessary from India's perspective? Because India started HPV vaccination this year for cervical cancer. This is one aspect where you can use these kind of pointers in your mains examination to substantiate your answers. And this is how answers have been written. If you look at, if you download the Vision IAS and the Forum IAS answer script, then whatever if they, if somebody writes the point, they have to substantiate that point also now almost for single single point also substantiation it is increasing it means that people are getting in deeper and deeper and you need to compete with them so these kind of substantiations you have to write in your answers also this gives that weightage to you so this is what this article is talking about it is about the study that has been conducted with respect to hpv vaccine with respect to cervical cancer and it has told that these vaccines have helped the deprived groups here this is the news here and this is what uh, it has been mentioned here also and uh, hpv vaccine uh, and various socio-economic spectrum uh, people belong to the vulnerable sections people belong to the deprived classes various uh, socio-economic spectrum it, this particular vaccine has helped those people and uh, see these kind of public health intervention interventions it has it can help to reduce the health inequalities also this point is also you can mention in your mains answer this is a school based vaccination program this was start started long before in western countries and even in england it was started almost 15 years ago now after a decade and a half study has been conducted and this study is regarding to public health interventions and how exactly this is impacting the lives of the citizens of united kingdom there so this is what and it clearly the ultimate if you look at the final conclusion the conclusion is these kind of vaccinations these kind of public health interventions they have helped the people and they directly help to reduce the health inequalities in the country so this is what the study is talking about but let me give you guys background information regarding cervical cancer also cervical cancer is continuously coming in news because the india has taken a decision that india is going to administer HPV vaccines to the school girls. So this decision has been taken and that is the reason every almost 15 days once one article is coming either in uh, Indian Express or in the Hindu with respect to cervical cancer with respect to HPV vaccine. The cervical cancer it usually starts in the cervix. Cervix is the uh, area it's it's a uh, uh, body organ where it is the it is located in the narrow end of uterus and the connection where the junction between uterus and the womb this is where cervix is situated and cervical cancer is affect directly affect the cells in this particular area and the cervical cancer is caused by a virus that is human papilloma virus that is hpv virus and the vaccine we give that is hpv vaccine human papilloma virus vaccine here and how exactly this is going to transfer this is going to transmit through the sexual contact here in india there are three types of cancer that are affecting our women in a very bad manner the first is breast cancer and the second comes uh, cervical cancer and the third comes mouth cancer and this mouth cancer mainly due to the tobacco chewing so these are the three primary uh, cancer causing reasons in our country cancer 
related deaths happening in our country and india is taking positive step in our, in, our, in this direction so if you look at the cervical cancer there are more than 1.23 lakh women they are getting affected infected every year they are getting affected every year and out of this around 77000 people uh, women they are dying every year this is very big number 77000 it means it's very big and that is the reason india has taken a decision that we are going to administer this vaccine to the school girls so that down the line 10 15 years we are going we will be successful in eliminating cervical cancer from the country and this is the intention and india is also aiming to uh, reduce cervical deaths by 90 percent down the line so this is one thing and india has also taking steps to eliminate breast cancer as well as the onco oncology cancer that is a mouth related cancers also due to the tobacco chewing cure and even if you look at the global uh, uh, cervical cancer burden india it is one fifth of the cervical cancer cases are coming from the one country one single country that is india so this shows that how greatly india is impacted with the cervical cancer here and india has decided that we are going to administer this particular vaccine and the name of the vaccine is seravac and this vaccine will be given to the school girls between 9 to 14 years see the main objective here what you have to focus here is this vaccine should be given before the first sexual contact so that is the reason they have uh, included the girls between the age of 9 to 14 years and even who has also recognized how serious the cervical cancer problem is and even it has uh, given that priority to eliminate cervical cancer as the public health program worldwide even who is also working in this direction and in india in 2018 only one particular state started uh, cervic, uh, vaccine cervical cancer vaccine and that state is sikkim so remember this also sikkim in 2018 only they have decided to administer this vaccine and there are some other countries if you look at the australia this is giving uh, uh, vaccine for human papilloma virus long ago but now very recently even uh, switzerland also australia switzerland they are administering this uh, cervical vaccine hpv vaccine to the male students also to the guys also so it means that it they have taken a step uh, one step ahead to eliminate the cervical cancer from the whole country so these are the steps you can write in your answers with respect to cervical cancer if, the, if it has been answered in the asked in the mains examination and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2016 mission indradhanush launched by government of india pertains to it is regarding immunization of children and pregnant women and let's move to the next news the next news is regarding h5n1 the bird flu and again this also from last one month we are discussing again and again let's see the article article it has been mentioned that can humans get h5n1 by consuming raw milk this is the question and don't ask me that uh, do we have to go through with these kind of minute details with respect to diseases and all answer is i don't know since hyn1 has been extremely in detail we had a discussion and so many articles we had discussion regarding hyn even uh, time and again articles are coming in the newspaper so it is again you can take it as a one step ahead a detailed analysis of hyn1 and let me give you guys what exactly this article is talking about answer is yes it says that yes uh, even in the raw milk the infection this particular infections are visible under the microscope here in this article it has been mentioned that see no cases have been mentioned uh, that uh, person who is consuming raw milk has been infected with hyn1 but it can be transmitted theoretically it is possible and this cow's milk uh, the cows which are infected by h1n1 their milk has been tested in the laboratories as well and the scientists they have found that high amount of h5n1 this particular virus type a virus was visible in the raw milk and they've given an instruction that even with respect to any uncooked dairy food products and even unpasteurized milk raw cheese of animals which are suspected to be confirmed by hyn1 bird flu virus should be avoided at all the cost this is the guidance and this is the instructions given by the government agencies here and this actually this information with respect to western countries you just remember that even in the raw milk also the virus load is uh, very much prevalent very much visible here but let me give you guys background information regarding hyn1 avian influenza here see hyn1 it is a bird flu and uh, this is infected by type a virus usually hyn1 this bird flu it has a four virus type a type b type c type c type d 
and the bird flu is caused by type A viruses here. And usually, initially we thought that uh, it is not possible to transmit to the human being. This bird flu cannot be transmitted to the human being and this virus cannot infect the mammals. But later on, there were so many cases we came across and we realized that yes, there is a possibility it can be transmitted to the human beings, it can be transmitted to the other mammals also and it can infect the uh, uh, mammals also and it can impact the humans also and especially if a person who is in com who comes with in co close contact with respect to any birds which are infected with this virus there are chances are more chance pr probability is more to get infected with bird flu so it, there is always a suggestion there is always a guidelines given by the government to stay away from those areas where the bird flu infected animals are situated and even the people if there is a poultry farm if some uh, birds are infected and even who are working that poultry farm who are exposed to these birds even they are also infected and the people who are living in the vicinities were also being victims of bird flu these kind of uh, situation these kind of uh, infections we have seen so many times and india in 2019 it was it has been declared as a avian free from a bird flu free from h5n1 but later within one year only and we could able to see that outbreak of avian influenza in the country so it shows that uh, it's Population is very vulnerable and even if you look at the poultry farm, duck farms in our country, somewhere they are not meeting that safety measure, safety priorities. It is taken for granted and these are all the reasons we cannot, it, it's not that easy to eliminate HYN1 from our country. It needs stricter rules, it needs stricter implementation but are we doing it? That is the question. If the cases comes, then we go there and we start killing these uh, birds there. We start uh, locking up these kind of poultry farms and duck farms but in general, in uh, the long term, uh, if you look at the steps we have taken to eliminate these kind of epidemics from the country, it's absolutely nil. Whenever the issues comes out, we go there and we, sta we start killing all these uh, birds and we start uh, burning all these birds, these kind of steps we take. But we are not taking a long term strategy, we are not, uh, we don't even know how to address in a longer uh, perspective. This is what the article is talking about. And let's see the symptoms in uh, humans as a, just like regular flu, the same symptoms we get here and it can also provide uh, sorry develop severe respiratory illnesses also and let's see types of uh, influenza viruses i told you that there are four types a b c d and usually a and b types these are the two types as a, whatever the seasonal infections we see the flu like in uh, infections and symptoms those are uh, caused by type a and b and the type c is mainly occurs in human beings and it can also be seen in dogs and pigs and the type d it's mainly seen in cattle there so these are the four types of influenza viruses here and let's see previous year question with respect to this particular topic uh, question was asked in 2015 h1n1 virus is sometimes mentioned in the news with reference to which of the following diseases it's regarding to swine flu here h5n1 is bird flu bird flu and h1n1 with, with respect to the swine flu here so let's move to the next news the next news is regarding India and UK relationship and express and very precisely this news article is talking about free trade agreement. Uh, see in year of 2022 both the countries India and UK we started negotiation with respect to free trade agreement. See before that uh, UK it was a part of European Union. Uh, so at that point of time we were having discussion to have free trade agreement with European Union so as a cumulatively we are having this discussion with all these countries there were 28 countries in the Union since UK was also one among these countries there was a cumulative cumulative negotiations were going on but when UK comes out of the uh, European Union uh, the Brexit happened then India took a decision that yes we need to develop we, we are going to develop a separate free trade agreement with UK also and India is uh, these days the discussions are going with other countries also even with Australia the discussion is going on and uh, even with the countries like ETFA 
those countries or those european countries are not member of european union those are etfa countries with etfa countries discussion is going on with european union discuss discussion is going on and even here with respect to uk discussion is going on india has really realized that we have a huge potential when it comes to trade and we need to uh, make sure that our trade and investment factors there is a cordial and consultative approach should be there and in order to have that open approach with respect to these we need to have custom made uh, customized agreements with different different countries see the terms and condition we agree with uk definitely we are not going to agree the same terms and condition with australia see uh, whatever the items we import from australia and what we export to australia is different from uk so we need to have a customized approach with respect to these kind of trade and investment agreement for that matter india is stepping positive taking a positive direction uh, with respect to free trade agreements around the world so let's focus on this news article here and here it has been mentioned that india and uk reaff reaffirms fta commitment at strategic dialogue here and there's almost a 20th uh, 20th round of uh, discussions were happened and uh, there's four five issues that need to be sorted out and that has created some issues between india and uk and i'll go, i'll go through with those aspects also what are the uh, issues of contention here why india is not agreeing why uk is not agreeing we'll go through with that issue also let's go through with this news art article both india and britain they've uh, given a press statement that there is a both the sides there is a commitment to sign this free trade agreement and this uh, whatever the agreement we do or the free trade agreement this is going to be a mutually beneficial to both the countries we will make sure that there will be a win-win situation for both the countries and uh, now india uk strategic dialogue process is going on and both the sides they've given a press, state, a press statement that uh, whatever the steps we are taking we are taking in a positive direction and everything we are ha whatever we are having it's a good progress here and we have a 2030 roadmap also we have some certain target that has not been uh, released to the people whatever the roadmap we have till 2030 we are going to reach there and we are going to deeper our relationship whether it is economical relationship geographical relationship or a security relationship sorry geopolitical relationship or a security based relationship we are going to improve our relationship the, the india and uk it is going to be a strategic relationship strategic relationship is a step by step increment so eventually we are going to get become a greater friends down the line so it is a strategic relationship here also and uh, uh, this discussion the latest round of discussion with respect to free trade agreement where both the countries they had a discussion regarding malaria vaccination and especially india developed its first malaria vaccination and discussion was going on with respect to malaria vaccination and also uh, defense cooperations are also being enhanced here so defense related uh, aspect and health related discussions were going on with respect to free trade agreement uh, very in the recent discussion this is what this news article is talking about and the now question is it's since 2002 it's almost two years and why 2022 it almost two years that why we could not able to sign the free trade agreement what are the issues the where discussions or the negotiations are still going on let's see those issues the first issue is intellectual property rights uk is not happy with india's intellectual property rights uk is telling that india uh, Indian intellectual property rights are very lenient. So because of this, it is going to threaten the investment or the trade of European, sorry, UK goods in India. See, in India, uh, we all know that intellectual property rights, it's not implemented properly. It's not strictly implemented properly. Theory-wise, yes, it's good. On paper, it's good. But if when we look at the implementation factor, it's not up to the mark. The main reason here is India's pharmacy india's pharmaceutical sector see we are dependent on generic drugs and these generic drugs are giving india as a huge economic benefit here see if you go through with the intellectual very strict implementation of intellectual property rights this is going to affect our uh, generic in drug industry this is going to affect the employment of our country this is going to affect the foreign trade also so that is the reason india is quite skeptical to strengthen the ipr in our country but uk sorry uk 
it want india to have a strong intellectual property rights and this is what uk companies are also telling see we start investing in the company but what happens since there is a weak ipr regime if some other com uh, companies uh, local companies in india if they start manufacturing dummy products or pirated products then it is going we are at the losing side we are going to lose the money so india should have a intellectual property rights very strong intellectual property right this is fun first contentious issues under negotiation and second comes global value chains see the global value chains between uk and india it's not very good even if you look at the trade routes the, there is only one suez canal if something goes wrong if there is some stuck happens then it is going to impact our trade also even though we are uh, going with the uh, projects like imec and all but on the whole if you look at the global supply value chains between uk and india there are some issues there are some complexities are there these issues also needs to be addressed this is the second thing and the third thing is regarding digital trade and especially india is going for a data localization it means that if a company is uh, taking information personal information from indian users that data should be stored in indian servers only so if google is collecting india's information service in information india is giving uh, india is going to implement data localization when that happens whatever the data google is collecting the indian data that should be stored in indian soil in indian servers this is the new rule but again uk is not happy with it because if a company their servers are already established there if they want to invest in india they want have to invest in, in these infrastructure also it is like one more extra burden extra financial investment here and these com companies are not happy with that because they are they have to spend more money so this has become another contentious issues under negotiation and the next comes rules of origin and india is very particular with respect to rules of origin what india is telling is uk and india we both are signing a free trade agreement so rules of origin should be very proper here see if china china sends its products to uk through uk it comes to india so it is a chinese products that is coming to india and that they have given a certificate that it is since it is coming from uk we have a free trade agreement so they are flooding the indian market they are misusing the free trade agreement we have signed with uk so india is telling that rules of origin should be there so we are going to give that free trade agreement provisions only to those aspects or those entities which are originated in uk only we are not going to give it to third country which are using which is using uk as a, a transit to send their product into the india so this has become another negotiation and finally india is also requesting uk uh, to give work permits easier work permits and make it easy to get visa also with respect to labor and environment india is asking a easier work permits for its citizen to work in uk and uk is not happy with that uk is telling that if india comes here and if india start getting the jobs this is going to affect the local population so this is again negotiations is negotiations are going on so these are the contentious issues with respect to free trade agreement between india and uk here so this is the news article and the background information and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2020 the judicial system in india and the uk seems to be converging as well as a diverging in recent times highlight the key points of convergence and divergence between two nations in terms of their judicial practices 2020 and let's move to the next news the final article is regarding chabahar port here it is that Chabahar port it is considered as a India's gateway to the Central Asia and historic details also be mentioned in this news article. So let's directly get into the discussion what exactly this news article is talking about and Chabahar is located here. Here it is Chabahar port and this is the border of Pakistan here, Balochistan this area and Afghanistan, Iraq and above here you see the Turkmenistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan kazakhstan all these comes above here so these are these countries are called as central asian countries central asian economies so let's get into the discussion of this article see uh, till 1979 india and iran relationship it was not at all good see uh, initially in iran pakistan and usa these were close allies there pakistan was a close ally of USA because India was tilting towards Soviet Union. So, USA had a close relationship with Pakistan and Iran 
till 1979 1979 islamic revolution happened in iran after that the relationship between iran and usa it went very bad so after this islamic revolution iran started developing good relationship with india so in 1970 iran thought to develop this particular chabahar port and even it thought to give usa to use it as a naval base but since the uh, relationship gone very bad in 1979 iran started looking for other partners to develop this particular port and the first country that came into its ambit is the india because one thing is geographically it's very near for india and india was also looking for an alternative it want to hijack the pakistan role there so in order to see pakistan we we were not having good terms even now we don't have a good terms with each other and india wanted connecting factor for the uh, central asian economies and it is not only the central asian economy even it is going to connect russia also there is a north south corridor which connects russia and uh, india especially the port of mumbai here even for all these connections we needed a entry point and that entry point was chabahar so chabahar there is a important geopolitical prominence is there and and also another aspect is if india gets that route here in chabahar in uh, in iran this is going to reduce the prominence of pakistan also in that region because mainly here the geolocation of pakistan with respect to its relationship with afghanistan its and with its uh, relation with central economies here if india could able to bypass the geographical uh, prominence of pakistan then automatically even at the international arena the pakistan promise uh, provi uh, uh, sorry provision or the prominence it is going to come down so this is also there is a geo geopolitical reason is also there to focus on chabahar port here and this chabaha port is uh, strategically located between gulf of oman and strait of hormuz i'll show you here see chabaha is located here and this is oman this is gulf of oman and this is strait of hormuz so it is located in between strait of hormuz and the gulf of oman here. and see in 1789 sorry 1979 the the relationship opened up india we got little bit closer but by the year of 1993 when pv narsim narsimha rao he was the prime minister of india the relationships got deeper actually and there was a visit from prime minister to uh, tehran and also there was visit from a uh, uh, high commission or, or the high, high authority of iran to india these kind of bilateral uh, visits it enhanced the relationship between Iran and India. So even after PV Narasimha Rao, even during Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee regime also, our relationships got deeper and deeper. And somewhere Tehran also, the Iran also giving uh, start start showing support to the India at international stage, even at the United Nations resolutions also. Uh, Iran started supporting India. So it's purely based on a hatred on US. Iran started supporting India, but for india it's an opportunity and since it's closer ally and uh, closer neighbor to india maritime neighbor so it's very important for india also to maintain that uh, goodwill gesture to have that uh, the uh, cooperative stand with respect uh, uh, with uh, iran also so in 1990s the relationship it has changed and even uh, in 1990s iran also offered uh, india chance to develop this chabahar initially it was it had in 1970s it offered it to usa but due to the relationship gone bad the same uh, privilege was given to india by iran in 1990s and especially mr pv narsimha rao and mr atal bihari vajpayee the situation got better and our relationship also got deeper and in 1990s there was a delhi declaration and under that delhi de declaration both the countries they have decided that we are going to build that connection between chabahar and the indian ports here and india also agreed that one thing it is going to invest in chabahar and another thing is this is going to invest in national iranian railroad also this railroad is going to connect to the afghanistan here and this is going to connect to the uh, Kyrgyz story, the Turkmenistan here. This is the Turkmenistan. This is going to this road is going to give that connectivity factor to the Central Asian econ economies. And it is going to give that connectivity factor to the Afghanistan. And India agreed that India also invested in this connectivity factor also.
and i talked about north south corridor that is connectivity from russia to india so that also it plays very important role see before uh, chabahar port india mainly we india and iran we used to do trade deals through the another port that is bandar abbas and somewhere that is located here in this area so this was a prominent port but this port is used mainly for the iran and india trade relationship but in order to have a deeper relationship with central asian economies chabahar plays very important role here and that is the reason uh, we are mainly focusing on development of chabahar and very recently last week somewhere india and uh, iran they have, we have signed an agreement uh, with respect to 10 year long term contract it means that for 10 year the, the two limited corporations are there one is indian ports global limited and ports and maritime organization of europe these two agencies they came together and they have signed an agreement to develop chabahar port and this agreement will be in stand for 10 years this is this kind of long term agreement this is going to make sure that there is a commitment from india and uh, along with that india also promised that we are going to give uh, 2000 sorry 250 million dollars line of credit for the overall development in that region and along with that 150 million more will be uh, outlay will be there in order for the uh, in and around the projects around the chabahar region also see i told you that after 1990s our relationships were good somewhere we were actively uh, uh, that negotiations were going on and we were actively uh, uh, making our presence in that regions also but the issue was after 2000 the situation went bad and somewhere there were allegations that iran is developing nuclear weapons for that usa put sanctions also and this sanctions made overall project to take a step back almost for 10 years india was quite skeptical with respect to this particular project the reason is us usa had put the sanctions and it has told that if any company of any country deals with iran then we are going to put sanctions on those companies and india obviously Indian companies, especially if, if there are public sector undertakings, then it is going to affect the Indian economy also. That is the reason India was quite skeptical with respect to Chabahar port. And somehow it has, it has maintained that goodwill gesture, it has made that positive aspect with respect to Iran. Iran was also fine, uh, Iran also understood that because of US sanctions, India open heartedly it cannot invest or open heartedly it cannot uh, be a important stakeholders in the Chabahar region. But eventually india surpassed it and india has made india has conveyed its message message to the world that see this chabahar port it is not only with respect to india and iran relationship this is with respect to afghanistan this is with respect to central asian economy on the whole this is going to be a win-win situation for the from the geopolitical aspect and it has convinced usa also so to some extent usa also agreed that uh, these sanctions are not going to be impacted with respect to chabahar project so india has given an indirect so us has given indirect assurance to india that we are not going to take steps with, res with respect to chabahar port so even somewhere india was successful in convincing us india was successful in uh, maintaining that relationship with iran also india was successful in pacify uh, russia also so all the three things india was successful in doing it see the reason india was very adamant with respect to chabahar port is if india take a step back then china is going to fill that vacuum if china comes to that particular place then it is going to be extremely difficult for india to handle the entire region because you know the sting of pearl so india somewhere china want to encircle india and it want to curtail india in the indian ocean region so from that perspective also chabaha plays very important role so from all these perspectives there is a geopolitical perspective is there there is an economic perspective that is trade and uh, uh, investment aspect is there and there is a uh, china factor is there and uh, north south corridor the trade related aspect from all these perspectives chabahar plays very important role here and uh, we since we there is a commitment for next 10 years india is going to be a very strong active player for the chabahar port here and this is what this article is talking about and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2017 the four statements have been given and you need to find the right statement with respect to chabahar port what is the importance of developing chabahar port by india i'll go there. i'll directly go to the answer that is c india will not depend on pakistan for the access of afghanistan and central asia so this is it for the day guys this pdf is available in uh, netbook study 
telegram channel network study telegram channel i would request please like the video subscribe to the channel and uh, subscribe to the telegram channel also i'll see you guys tomorrow with current affairs video have a good time thank you for listening